Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Ephrata Live, and it's time for our first daily dose of Jumpstart 2022 spoilers. So Jumpstart 2022 edition coming out in a couple of weeks, and this is an eternal set. So these are cards not legal in Standard, not legal in Modern, not legal in Pioneer, but they are legal in Legacy Vintage, and most importantly in the case of the cards from this set, in Commander, and oh my goodness, are there some sweet cards. There's a bunch of sweet new Legends, some new Mana Rocks, some stuff that's definitely worth discussing. So we should probably jump right into it, start talking spicy new Jumpstart cards. Before we do, a couple quick reminders. Number Number one, if you need some Jumpstart cards, you can snag them from our awesome sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfishing. Number two, to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you should mosey on over to mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk spicy new cards from Jumpstart 2022. So first up today, we got my favorite card from the set so far, and it's not even especially close, and that is Preston the Vanisher. It's a 4-mana 2-5 white rabbit wizard for some reason. It's a legendary creature, and then it says, whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it wasn't cast, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except the 0-1 white illusion, then you can pay 2 and sack 5 illusions to exile a non land. Uh, that's a fringe upside, I guess. Maybe you're putting a rest your board and you can cash in some illusions to get rid of a whatever artifact or enchantment or something. The real power of this card, though, is this is Blink Panharmonicon. Uh, it seems so incredibly powerful in a Blink style deck or even as a commander of a Blink style deck. So if you think about what Preston wants, it wants creatures coming into play without being cast. So how do you actually do that? You could reanimate them. That's not bad. If you can mass reanimate, you're going to get a whole bunch of illusions and double up all those creatures. But the easiest way, I think, is just to play a Blink deck. And I'm especially excited for Preston because I recently built an Abdul Adrian Mono White Blink deck in paper. It's one of my, like, five paper decks at this point. I had a Brago deck, but I thought it was a little bit miserable and OP. And I thought that going Mono White might power it down, make it more fun. Uh, Preston, one million percent replacing Abdul Adrian as a commander of that deck because it's essentially a Panharmonicon. If you think about how this works, if you're playing a Blink deck, you're usually playing a bunch of small creatures with Enter the Battle field triggers anyway and trying to get value out of blinking them so let's say you play a creature and then you ephemerate it if you have preston out you're going to get two of that creature sure one of those is going to be a zero one illusion but you don't care because you're blinking stuff for etb value anyway or restoration angel any sort of blink effect but the real payoff for preston is mass blink uh the absolute dream lazelle's acrobatics with the high roll let's say you build a big board full of creatures you got preston you lazelle's acrobatics you exile your creatures they all come back into play you're you're gonna get two of them uh, because you have Preston, so you're gonna get the illusion copies. But then since you high rolled, all those creatures are gonna exile again and come back into play, except it's not gonna exile the token copies because that's how Lozelle's Acrobatics is worded. Then they come in back into play. You're gonna get their ETBs again. You're gonna get another Preston trigger. It's absurd. You get like four of every ETB trigger. Also works with like Eerie Interlude. Ghost Away is a little awkward because it exiles your tokens too and you'll lose them, but still gets the job done. Uh, Semester Zen, a little bit more expensive, but also can do the same trick so i think that's how you want to build preston and remember as i talked about before if you're playing a blink deck if i was looking through my mono white blink deck i'm not really playing big creatures i don't really care if my spirited companion the token copy is a zero one because i'm not playing spirited companion to try to beat you down i'm playing spirited companion because it etb draws a card the same is true of like palace jailer karmic guide these are creatures that the zero one version of them is not meaningfully worse than the actual version sure it's a little bit smaller but you're playing them to get the power powerful ETB trigger anyway, so being a zero one illusion, really isn't that much of a downside. So Preston Blink Panharmonicon, it is going to lead my mono white Blink deck, and I think it's an easy upgrade for any sort of Blink deck in the 99. If you have a Brago deck, a Rune deck, an Aminatu deck, a Yarian deck, Preston seems like such a great inclusion in that deck, and it is going to do some really crazy, super fun, really spectacular things. So Preston, I love it. Such a cool design. I cannot wait to play with this card. We also got a new Rat Legend, Ashcott of the Shadow Swarm, a four mana, three, four, or rat warlock it's a legend whenever it attacks or blocks other rats you control get plus x plus x until end of turn where x is the number of rats you control so kind of like a a weird coat of arms for your rats and then being your end step you can mill four cards if you do you return two rat cards from your graveyard to your hand so we've talked a lot recently about wizards powering up janky tribes by giving them commanders that generate card advantage ashka is another one of these it does it in kind of its own unique way where it mills and gets back rats but still in a rat deck this is drawing you two extra cards 
cards he'd shirt. And then its attacker block ability is kind of insane. If you just fill the board with cheap rats, this is going to be giving your team plus five, plus five, plus 10, plus 10. It's going to be closing out the game. Like picture the like just curve out of one drop rat, two drop rat, three drop rat, Ashcott. The next turn you attack, all of your stuff is going to be getting what? Plus four, plus four. That's kind of insane. You're going to be threatening lethal really early in the game with Ashcott as a commander of your rat deck. So I think this is the best rat commander. If there's any concern for this card, it might actually be too good. Uh, Richard pointed this out on yesterday's podcast that he plays a lot of coat of arms. And this is like kind of a coat of arms just for you that's hanging out in your command zone. And your opponents, once you start getting some rats on the battlefield, are going to be like, oh no, what if they have an Ashcott? What if they give a haste with a lightning greaves or a swift foot boots? I could just be dead here. So it's probably going to lead to players trying to keep your board clean of rats or either just killing you. So I think this is the most powerful rat commander. Although maybe there's an argument for sticking with Maronar or something, which is a decent rat commander, just because it doesn't look as threatening as Ashcott. It, rats, I don't know if they're powerful enough to be the arch enemy at the table. Like, yes, Ashcott's great. And if you have it, it's great. And if you can keep a board of rats, it's great. However, I don't know if your other tribe members are going to be strong enough to hold up to the heat if everyone's trying to deal with you. Also, really sweet leader for Rat Colony or Relentless Rats. If you want to build the beam decks of like, I'm playing 40 of the same card in my deck, Ashcott's perfect there. You're going to mill presumably two Rat Colonies or Relentless Rats each turn. You play them, they're going to pump your team, and then Ashcott pumps it even more. You can also just play it as a generic Rat Commander. Play your Bugler Rats, and Crypt Rats, and Swarm Rats, whatever rats you like with Ashcott leading the way. So Ashcott, kind of a busted commander. It's a busted commander, but it's a busted commander for a tribe that honestly probably need one, needs one because rats just aren't that strong of a tribe. So I'm actually glad this card exists. Just be warned, once players die to this a couple of times, you're probably going to end up being the arch enemy. And I just don't know if you want to be the arch enemy while you're playing rat tribal. Speaking of interesting new commanders, we also got Shash Skittering Schwarmlord, a 5 mana 5-5 five, five legendary insect. It says you can play lands and cast insect spells from your graveyard, and whenever another insect you control dies, so you get to put it on the bottom of its owner's library, and then you mill two cards, so it fills the graveyard to give you insects and lands to play from the graveyard, and then you can pay 2 mana to give it insect death touch until end of turn and plus 1 plus 0, yeah, whatever, that's fine. The big deal is, this is another one of those commanders for a relatively janky tribe that generates an absurd amount of card advantage. Being able to not only cast your tribe members from the graveyard, but also lands is incredibly strong. So I think there is a question if this is the best insect commander. I didn't realize this, but insects have kind of gotten some good commanders lately. Grist is really strong, technically legal as your commander, even though it's a planeswalker because it's also a creature. And that is very good. And they work really well together. Grist also wants to fill your graveyard with insects. So if you're playing Grist, I think you want Zosk in your deck. If you're playing Zosk, Ask, you want Grist in your deck. There's also like the new Zero, which is kind of sweet. Blacks, I guess, if you want to go full on jank mode. Uh, definitely a lower powered commander, but still, it is a good leader for the insect tribe. So I think that Zosk is either like the best or second best insect commander. And even beyond insects, I think the most important and exciting part of this card is this is a Crucible of Worlds or Ramanop Excavator that you can play from your command zone. This is something we've never seen before. We have quite a few playlands from your graveyard effects now, but I'm pretty sure this is the first one that's a legend. So I think you could just completely disregard the insect aspect of this card, or maybe play a couple incidental insects and build land from your graveyard tribal where you're trying to like recur strip mines or recur fetch lands, maybe at landfall trigger, scoot, Swarm or Lotus card, but there's a lots of good ones in green and black. And then you play extra land drop cards. So you can be playing the same fetch land with Azusa like three times from your graveyard, throwing an Oracle Moldiah, and you can just be strip mine locking people out of the game. You can be ramping an absurd amount with this single fetch land coming from your graveyard, triggering your landfall triggers a bunch of times. So honestly, I'm more hyped to build land from the graveyard tribal, some sort of value town style deck with Zask than I am insect tribal. Like I think Grist is already a good enough insect tribal leader. Uh, and this is a fine way to lead your Linsect Tribal deck. I'm not saying that it's a bad Insect Tribal card, but for me, the more unique part of this card is the Crucible of Worlds from your Command Zone effect. So that's the direction I would head, but this card is definitely super sweet. We also got, speaking of new green commanders, Run Adi Behemoth Caller, a 3 mana 1 3 legendary cant shaman. It says when you cast a creature spell with mana value 5 or later, that creature enters a battlefield with X additional plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is its mana value minus four kind of a weird ability essentially what that's saying is if you cast a five mana value card it gets one counter if you cast a six mana value card 
Six minus four, you get two counters. Seven mana value card. Seven minus four, three counters. Uh, and that's kind of the sweet spot because its second ability is creatures you control that have three or more plus one plus one counters on them have haste. So you can play this as a pretty powerful ramp effect. You play a seven drop, it gets those three counters. You haste it in, you smash someone with it. And then it taps to add a mana. So I actually think this card is kind of interesting. There's a couple directions you can go with this as your commander. Hydras seem really good. Any X spell creatures work really good. Uh, Hydras probably the most obvious one you can build mono green hydras with it also tyranid the new warhammer tribe that also was kind of hydra-esque cares about x spells has a lot of x spell creatures this is perfect there because then you got a lot of flexibility if you got enough mana you can cast this for a huge amount put a ton of counters on the creature smash your opponent to death but you still can play your stuff in the early game so you're not just stuck with a huge handful of expensive cards so i think that's one direction to go x spell mono green tribal another direction if you want to go mean with this card is just play like mono green Eldrazi ramp. Eldrazi like Ulamog or Kozilek or whatever being hasted in with a bunch of counters is absolutely frightening, especially the Annihilator ones. This is just going to get people. And if there's one thing that mono green is good at, it's ramping. It doesn't seem that hard, especially with Runati making a little mana itself for you to be casting your Ulamog on like turn five or something in a mono green deck. And when that's coming down with I don't even know, 11 minus four, seven plus one plus one counters, and it's indestructible, and it has Annihilator four, you're potentially just taking someone out of the game. So that's the mean way to go with this card. Another kind of in-between way to go, I think is to embrace the plus one plus one counter theme. If you want to play mono green hardened scales in Commander with hardened scales and Ozolith and doubling season, where your goal isn't necessarily to play the biggest, scariest creatures, but you play creatures, you put counters on them, you double your counters, you'll get up to three counters in other ways with Runati to trigger that hate stability by like doubling your counters with doubling season or whatever uh, so that's another way you can go that doesn't require you to play as many big creatures also seems like a sweet 99 card for a bunch of commander decks magnus lucia zaraxa also kind of insane with galta galta if you cast that from your command zone with runati out it's going to be a 20 20 haste trampler one off of having commander damage lethal if you throw like a hardened scales into the mix or something you actually can just one shot someone with commander damage also rocket Draka cares about seven mana spells or naughty the sweet spot is we talked about seven mana and it's a mana dork so it works with rocket Draka. also we're getting voraclax just with the counter synergies so we're naughty I think this card's pretty sweet. It's a cool commander. Uh, you can build it mean with Eldrazi. You can build it nicer, mid-powered with Hydras or Hardened Scales. And then gem it in the 99 of any of those decks we talked about. We also got Rudolf Dustbringer, a new six mana 4-4 four, four legendary vampire angel. I think this might be the first or one of the only vampire angels we have in all of magics. It is flying death touch and life lake. When you gain life, it gains indestructible until end of turn. In the beginning of your end step, you can pay two mana, one in a hybrid or sub mana. And when you do, you reanimate a creature with mana value X or less, where X is the amount of life that you gain this turn. So Rudolph, this card's kind of interesting. You can go a whole bunch of different directions with this as your commander. You can be straight up life gain and just try to maximize the reanimation mode and it gains life itself. So even just it hitting is gonna let you reanimate something up to what? four mana, which isn't actually that bad. And if you have extra life gain, you could be reanimating anything like a repeatable animate dead from your command zone. You could also go vampires or angels with it. I think this might be one of the more interesting Orzhov life gain commanders. We have many of these. Orzhov life gain is a pretty well supported theme in commander. The twist of Rudolph is that reanimation aspect being thrown in. If you want to be a life gain deck, but you also want to embrace the reanimates and animate deaths and invoke justices, I think that Rudolph is a pretty perfect card to lead that deck so like reanimation life gain hybrid also kind of an interesting commander if you want to go orzhov angels angels just incidentally gain a lot of life eh, lyra bane slayer righteous valkyrie that's kind of angels gimmick is a lot of them have lifelink so if you can just play some big angels you're going to be reanimating a big angel every single turn with rudolph for just two mana could also go vampires there's a couple of orzhov vampire commanders but vampires another tribe that really supports the life gain theme but in a very different way than angels if you 
know, like angels, angels are just like, here's my huge life linker, smash you, gain a ton of life. Vampires, on the other hand, have more like sneaky sacrifice life gain, cruel celebrants, blood artists. Those are vampires. You got Vito to gain even more life and do combo shenanigans. So I think that's the other way you could go. And the nice thing about going blood artist vampire Rudolph is you probably want to be sacrificing your stuff anyway. So you can do some sweet little value aristocrat loops where you do a bunch of sacrifice stuff. You trigger your blood artist a bunch and then Rudolph's going to trigger on your end step to reanimate something that you've sacrificed and you do it again the next turn. So Rudolph, I like the flexibility of this card. It is six mana, so it's an expensive commander, but I really like that you can go life gain reanimator, you can go Orzhov angels, or you can go vampires with this card. So a lot of different options as far as what you want to build around Rudolph. Next up, we have Astar. <laughs> I am Astar, a robot. I can put my arm back on. You can't, so play safe. Uh, I mean, Alita Mechanical Engineer. It's a three minute, three, three legendary artifact creature artificer. It is vigilant. Says so the beginning of your end step, untap each other artifact creature you control. Then you can pay for and tap it to make a five, five colorless vehicle artifact token named Zeppelin with flying and crew three. So Alita, kind of a weird, like mono white artifact creature vehicle commander. You get this like bad unwinding clock, essentially. It only untaps during your or untap step instead of all your opponent's turns and it only specifically untaps artifact creatures but still this lets you like attack with your vehicles attack with your zeppelins and then have them untapped on defense or have your creatures untapped if you're playing artifact creatures to crew again so it does some nice like offense defense stuff and then the tokens you're making the zeppelin tokens they're not bad. I mean, it's kind of like a weather light completed a 5 5 flyer, maybe not a Lloyd ship without the upside and maybe playing stuff from your opponent's graveyard. But 5 5 flyers with crew three don't seem bad and they're not legendary. So you can be making one of these, or if you got combos or untapped shenanigans, more than these each turn with Lita and just flooding the board with these big flying vehicles. So I think that Lita, one concern I have for it is. Uh, if you want to play mono white vehicles, Sram is just so good. It's hard to pass up the card advantage, and while Lita does a lot of things, and I guess you can argue the Zeppelin it makes is a form of pseudo card advantage, it doesn't just draw you cards. It's not one of those snowball commanders. So it's hard for me to imagine, even though mono white vehicles does have quite a bit of support, Peace Walker, Colossus, Sandwells, and enough vehicles to make it work, it's hard for me to imagine going with Lita over Sram, because Sram is just Oh, it's so good as a vehicle commander because of the card advantage it generates. On the other hand, I think this is a fine 99 card in vehicle decks, probably especially good in Shikori where uh, you want to be tapping it to draw cards and then you can untap it with Lita to draw even more cards and make even more pilots. And then I think it's fine in like Depala or Grease Fang, any of these other vehicle matter style decks. The other place you can play this is with kind of a new theme in Magic, which is Artifact Creatures Matters. In just the last couple of years, we got in like Alibu, we got got Toskia, Lucille, brand new Urza Chief Artificer. These are commanders that specifically want you to play not just artifacts, but artifact creatures. So in an artifact creature matters deck, like Urza Chief Artificer, Lita's kind of great. It's an artifact creature. It also is a payoff for having artifact creatures because it untaps all of them. And then you get the vehicle mode as a bonus. So I think that's the other place that Lita could show up. So Lita... Eh, not one of my favorite cards from the set, but it is a cool addition to vehicle decks. We also got a non-legend, our first non-legend we've talked about, Termination Facilitator, a two mana one three human assassin. You tap it to put a bounty counter on target creature or planeswalker only as a sorcery. And then whenever a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls with a bounty counter on it is dealt damage, destroy it. So I think there are two places this card could see play. One is in just jam in assassin tribal, even though I don't think it's a special good in Assassin Tribal, but if you just need more Assassins to fill out your curve, it's fine. I think the main place for this card, though, is going to be as a backup to Bounty Hunter. Being able to tap to put a Bounty Counter on something is a really rare ability. Actually, Bounty Hunter is the only other creature in Magic that does this, so if you're playing a commander like Chevelle or Mathis that just really wants Bounty Counters on your opponent's stuff because your commander can take advantage of them, Termination Facilitator going to be an all-star in those decks, because like I said, it's just not easy to put 
put bounty counters on things. And then I guess you can kind of take advantage of the bounty counters. Like if you're playing Chevelle or Mathis, you like get a bunch of bounty counters on things and then like a single pestilence activation will wipe out all those creatures if you have termination facilitator on the battlefield since you only got to deal a single damage to a thing to destroy it. So termination facilitator, most decks will not care about this card or want this card. You're not just going to run it in a generic black deck or anything like that. I guess assassins maybe, but in those specific decks that care about bounty counters, this is a really huge upgrade because there just aren't that many cards that put bounty counters on things. We also got pirated copy, our Napster card from the set. It's eight five mana zero zero shapeshifter pirate when it enters the battlefield it enters as a copy of any creature on the battlefield except it's a pirate in addition to its other types and it has whenever this creature or another creature with the same name deals combat damage to a player you draw a card so pirated copy on level one, it is a expensive clone that keeps its pirate creature type. I think that because it keeps its pirate creature type, if you're playing some sort of pirate tribal deck, you probably play this. Uh, pirates just need all the support they can get. There's not that many great pirates in Magic. It's getting better, it's improving, but we still need more good pirates. So I think this will probably find its way into pirate tribal decks just because there's not that many good pirates. And also keep an eye on this in the future because we know we're going back to Ixalan. Ixalan is like, the pirate set so i expect that pirates are going to get a big boost in the future like a year from now when we go back to ixalan so this might be a card that gets even more important in the future the other interesting part about this card is the card draw effect so the first thing i thought of is like play this in a persistent petitioner deck and you copy a persistent petitioners but then anytime you deal combat damage with the persistent petitioners you're going to draw a card so it turns into this like weird toski style clone could also work with something like relentless rats a little bit awkward on your opponent's creatures like if your opponent has a creature and you copy it with pirated copy your opponent's copy is going to have the same name so if they hit you or someone else they're also going to draw cards which is a little bit awkward so you're kind of incentivized to target your own things even though if your opponent has some bomb it's probably worth it to give your opponent a card there's also been some chatter about spy kit which just gives everything all names so that would maximize the card draw aspect of pirated copy i don't know if you actually want just like everything to be drawing a bunch of cards when it attacks but it is kind of a neat synergy the main trick though i think for this card is using it with tokens so the way tokens work is the token's name is essentially their creature type like uh secure the waste it makes x11 white warrior creature tokens the name of that token is warrior so that means if you pirated copy one of those tokens as counterintuitive as that sounds anytime those tokens any one of them deals damage it is going to trigger to draw you a card so i think that's another way to take advantage of this if you're playing a token deck that has a bunch of tokens with the same name with the same type then pirated copy can be a very effective card draw spell works with evasive tokens ink shield bitter blossom even better because you're more likely to combat damage and one of the cool things we've seen recently is tokens really expanding into blue colors the most recent is esper we got Soundwave, we got uh marinus kelgar which are both esper token commanders which is a color combination that just hasn't really had good token commanders so i think pirated copy really nice there if you're built around those also adrix and if Burdiclad, other commanders that are in blue that care about tokens in specific so pirated copy it looks like an expensive clone, but when you think about all the synergies, it's creature type synergies, it's token synergies, it's persistent petitioner synergies. There's actually a lot of cool things the card could do. Moving into the realm of lower rarity cards, here's a few interesting ones worth talking about. We got two new mana rocks, they could have some commander potential, Planner Atlas and Infernal Idol. So Planner Atlas, two mana, mana rock, ETBs tapped. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library. If you do reveal up to one land card from among them, put them on the top of your library, the rest go on the bottom in a random order. And then Infernal Idol, three mana, mana rock, it taps for black, but it has the upside that you can pay three mana and sacrifice it to draw two cards and lose two life. So I think each of these cards in the right deck can actually be pretty powerful in command. So Planner Atlas, it's a two mana mana rock, which is kind of the baseline rate for mana rocks. Yes, coming into play tapped is a drawback. We see that with like Guardian Idol, which doesn't see that much play. A tapped two mana mana rocks generally rank behind untapped two mana mana rocks because if they're tapped, you can't use the mana right away. One of
one of the lines you see in Commander is like, on turn three, you can play a Signet and then tap the Signet with your extra land to play another Signet. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that with Planner Atlas. On the other hand, you do get this like Loam Larva mode where you get to dig for a land, not generating card advantage because it goes on top. So I think this is a card that I would consider in decks that really actively want specific lands. Like if you're trying to find Coffers and Urborg, digging four cards deep to try to find one of those and put it on top of your deck, it might be worth playing a tap two mana mana rock, especially since two mana mana rocks aren't bad. As far as Infernal Idol, it's kind of Black Hedron Archive. It does almost the same thing, except it's on a three mana mana rock that makes one mana, but you get that same upside that when you don't need mana in the late game, you can cash it in for some cards. I know three mana mana rocks are kind of on the outs in Commander, but I've had a lot of success playing three mana mana rocks with upside. Like the Celest is one of my favorite mana rocks. The looting it does throughout the course of the game, the incidental life gain totally makes it worth playing in a lot of decks. And I think Infernal Idol is going to be the same. If I'm playing like a mono black deck, I think this makes its way into my my deck even though it's three mana just because i really like hedron archive style rocks that can draw me cards in the late game so both of these cards i think got potential although i'm probably most hyped about infernal idol we also got primeval herald a four mana three one elf scout would trample when it enters a battlefield you can search your library for a basic land put it on the battlefield tapped but you can also do this when it attacks so primeval herald it's kind of a solemn simulacrum that is wearing its own sort of the animus the question's gonna be how many lands can you get with this card explosive vegetation and other four mana green ram spells just get you two lands right away if you are only getting two mans with primeval herald it's probably not worth it on the other hand if there's a reasonable chance you can get three lands or maybe four lands then there's a lot of upside so i think this is the card that most decks probably won't want it however if you're playing a deck that can really take advantage of its etb aspect like yarok or rune then i think it's worth it because if if you got a Yarok out, you play this, you already get two lands right away. So you already have an explosive vegetation and then you get the additional upside that maybe you blink it, maybe you reanimate it, maybe you get in some attacks with it and you're able to take and uh, get even more lands out of it. And it's worth noting, it triggers uh, when it attacks, not when it deals combat damage. So worst case, you chump attack with it and you get a free land out of it that way anyway. So Yarok decks, maybe blink decks like Rune could take advantage of it. So a card that I like quite a bit, but again, mostly for a narrow subset of decks. We also got due to replicator which is a pretty interesting card a three mana two three assembly worker when it enters a battlefield you can pay one when you do you create a token that's a copy of target token you control that's not named dutiful replicator so dutiful replicator the interesting aspect of this card, I think, is its ability to, for four mana, come into play and copy a token you control. So most token decks aren't going to want this, because a lot of token decks are built about playing a bunch of 1-1 one -one tokens, these small tokens going super wide, and a deck like that, Dutiful Replicator, is actually pretty bad. Like, paying a mana to make another 1-1, one -one, totally not worth it, especially on a creature that definitely is above the curve. On the other hand, if you're playing a deck that's built around big tokens, like a Burdiclad wants to make this massive token, and then and turn everything into that massive token. Maybe Gyrid really wants the biggest tokens it can make because then you can populate them. Or Trostani, then I think Dutiful Replicator is pretty nice. If you're copying a 5-5 five, five token, a 10-10 ten, ten token for one mana, then Dutiful Replicator is kind of an absurd card. So think through what kind of token deck you're playing. If you're like a go tall big token deck, I think this card's great. If you're a go wide style token deck though, it's not very good at all. The other place I've seen people talking about this card is with Mishra Eminent One. So Mishra, our new Mishra, at the beginning of combat on our turn, we get to create a token that's a copy of target non-creature artifact you control, except its name is Mishra's War Form, and it's a 4-4 construct in addition to its other type. It gains haste, you got a sack, and deterred. So this is actually a pretty easy combo. So you have Mishra, you play Dutiful Replicator, you use Mishra to turn it into a copy, uh, but remember, Mishra replaces the name on the card. It's not going to be Dutiful Replicator anymore it's going to be Mishra's War Form rather than Dutiful Replicator. So what this means is you can kind of go infinite. Uh, you Mishra the Dutiful Replicator. It becomes Mishra's War Form. When it comes into play, you can use the new Dutiful Replicator, which is no longer Dutiful Replicator of Mishra's War Form, to pay another mana to copy itself. Then you pay another mana to copy itself. Then you pay another mana to copy itself. So by itself, Dutiful Replicator with Mishra lets you make a 4-4 for every mana you have available, essentially. However, 
if you also have Ashnod's Altar, where you can sacrifice some of these to make mana, then you just go truly infinite, and you're able to take and sacrifice enough dutiful replicators, which are actually Mishra's Warforms, to make an infinite number of them and win the game with these hasty tokens out of the spot. So I think that is maybe the most exciting thing this card could do. We also got Distinguished Conjure, a 2 mana 1 2 human wizard that says whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life, and then you can pay for to exile another creature you control and then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So this is essentially a bad soul warden. Two mana only triggers on your stuff. Combined with like a bad mist meadow witch, maybe worth mentioning just for like blink style decks, but I don't know. Its body is not that good. Five mana and tapping to blink is kind of an expensive way to do it, but it's a card I would consider for like my mono white blink deck. If you're in three colors, I think you got better options, but a little bit of incidental life gain, never a bad thing. I like having a couple cards in my commander decks that can gain life just because I hate being the person that's like at five life when everyone else is at 30 and you're just like under that pressure all game so I like it as an incidental life gain card and then even though the blink mode isn't great you can probably get some value out of it sometimes a couple other quick things to mention on the way out the door today the set has some surprisingly good reprints a uh, world breaker lyra hanger back walker blood artist walkie ballistic card liberated kiki jiki mirror breaker there's more reprint value in this set than I honestly would have expected although it is worth mentioning how jumpstart works so jumpstart assuming this works like the last jumpstart the themes themselves some are rare than others so it might be that the theme that has Karn liberated the Tron theme that might be like a mythic theme so your odds of getting that might be a lot lower than getting a theme that doesn't have as valuable of a reprint but still is worth mentioning there are some pretty good reprints of the set another thing to mention about this set its gimmick, or at least one of them, is every pack you open is going to have an anime-inspired art card. So we're getting all these, like, reprints that have anime art, spell stutter sprites, cold steel art, spectral sailors, magnifying glasses, diabolic edicts, mirror image... Ah, uh, anime is not really my thing. I know Krim is like super hyped about these cards, but I'm curious what you think. Is this anime in every pack theme, is that a draw for you? Uh, is it a negative for you? Do you just not really care? So curious people's thoughts on these anime art reprints. Finally today, there's a bunch of lore rarity stuff that I think is mostly for like Jumpstart Limited playing out of the pack. Some of it, like maybe there's a very specific commander deck that could want it, but it's stuff that is narrow enough or underpowered enough that I don't think it's really Really worth talking about individually but I did want to let you know that it exists and if you want to see all of it along with any new spoilers throughout the day you can find them over at mtgpreviews.com anyway that brings us to the end of our first daily dose of jumpstart 2022 spoilers so what do you think what are you most hyped for what do you think about the set what do you think about the anime reprints the reprints in general are you gonna be buying a box do you like playing jumpstart or you're just gonna pick up the singles let me know what you're thinking in the comments thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed it and i'll be back tomorrow with more jumpstart 2022 spoilers so until then have a spectacular day and I will talk to you soon.